So we have already discussed previously that if we have a relation R and a selection over R that is interested in yeah, certain tuples, for instance, the ones from R that have A attribute equals to a certain number, let's say 17. So now if there's an index built on relation R on this attribute A, then the database system can notice this and can evaluate the query, not reading all of the values here, but accessing using an index only those that have A equal 17. And this greatly, of course, increases the performance. And of course, there, there are some considerations. We have also discussed that if you want to have a range query, let's say A should be bigger than um, 1,500, and you um, have a non-clustered index, well, maybe it's better to read the entire relation R before you're wildly jumping around in the data file on disk with random accesses if the cluster, uh, if the index is not a clustered index. So it's always um, needs to be a bit um, more consideration. It's, it's often not as easy to say there's an index, use it. But it's exactly the task the database system has to fulfill and we have to understand in order to, in an intelligent way, create indices and write queries. So this was the implementation of the selection operator, but of course we can look at the other operators as well. In particular interesting is the join operator and also aggregation and duplicate elimination. But of course we also have to consider projection as well. So if you're writing now an SQL query, you have seen this already a couple of times, then the SQL query will be translated in an operator tree. So you have a tree, let's say usually you have a projection on top and then perhaps a selection and below that you have a join and a join involving relation R and S, right? And in the undercritical course you also looked at, uh, at um, rule-based query optimization that would try to move down here the selection operator as far down as possible, for instance here or maybe a part of the selection predicate could also be placed here in order to read as few tuples as possible. Now, we're talking about the implementation of operators. This means that for the, yeah, for the implementation, there are often multiple options. And now we're not talking about logical query optimization, but we're talking about physical query optimization that tries to decide which implementation should be used for which of the operators. Right. And as the, again, the example of having an access to a table and we have an index on it, we don't have to use a simple scan operator, but we can use an operator that can work with index structures to retrieve the tuples more efficiently. And this, as I mentioned already, is called physical query optimization. So we want to see which alternatives exist in terms of implementation. We will briefly look at cost models as well. And the idea is, of course, to pick the plan or the physical query plan that is the cheapest. So the evaluation will hopefully be fast, right? And um, yeah, we have already discussed this the use of indices for, for query evaluation, for the scanning of relations. And also we have seen in a couple of examples that even so you have an index, this might not be the best um, solution to also use it for certain queries. So when we have an operator like the join, and here you see a theta join, with theta being the predicate that decides which of the tuples can be joined. And if you have multiple options, and then the output of this physical optimization would be a query plan where we have not only these operators um, named, like a join, but after physical optimization, we will have an annotated plan where we have, in addition to just saying it's a join, we also mention the type of implementation that should be used, right? And depending on the data characteristics, it can be that for a join, a nested loop is cheaper than a sort merge join or a hash join. And depending on the predicate here, sometimes one or the other is not even applicable, right? And this is like the topic for the next uh, minutes. 
So here we see the join implementation. We will discuss in the lecture. Some are a bit more complicated, some are a bit um, restricted in their use. So they all have pros and cons. And we will start with the simplest one, which we call nested loop join. When we're talking about joins, in general, and cost of a join, it is clear that the cost of a join depends largely on the um, sizes of the input relation. So the join always, the join is a binary operator and we have relation R and S. And then the cost to compute the join is based on R and S. It's not only based on the sizes of R and S, but it's also based on the selectivity of the join, meaning how many tuples will be the result um, of, this, of this join. Right. Well, the results, uh, result is not called selectivity, but the selectivity is the ratio between the result tuples and the number of possible result candidates. And the number of result candidates is just the size of the Cartesian product. So if you have R and S, then the maximum number of tuples we can get as output is this. And if the selectivity is very large, then we get very many results as the output. And if the selectivity is small, it means we have a very few results only. Okay, so here is the first algorithm, nested loop join. This is like a really a brute force algorithm. And if you look at the name, it's nested loop, it gives it already away. So what you're doing here is you're looping over both relations and you're looking at all possible combinations of R and S tuples, and you're evaluating if the join predicate is evaluated into true. And if it's true, then you're appending the concatenation of the two tuples in your result, right? So we have a for each loop for each R in R. You're going over S. That means as many times, or as many tuples you have in R, you're scanning relation S. And here you're checking the join predicate. Well, if it's true, you're producing an output tuple. So the idea is to compute or to create, to enumerate like a cross product, which is the same as a Cartesian product, just a different name. And you're checking if these produced pairs of tuples fulfill the join predicate. Now the problem is that this is of quadratic complexity because you're looking at all combinations of the left input and the right input. But the big advantage is it works for arbitrary predicates. Here we have the case of an equijoin, an equality join, which tests if the B attribute of S equals the A attribute of R. In general, this could be any predicate zeta that is applicable or applied to tuples from R and S. Right? So this is only an example of an equality join. So why does this work now for all possible predicates? Well, a join is always defined or is defined as if you have a join S and R, this is nothing else than S cross product R. And for this, we are applying a selection with a predicate, right? This is not the arbitrary predicate zeta. If we want to make an equijoin, we just use this one here or some predicate using equality. So why is it possible now for the nested loop join to compute all possible joins? Well, because it enumerates a cross product. So it will look at all possible combinations and it uh, for each of the combinations, it will check if the predicate is true. So there's no risk of missing some results because we have the largest um, possible result set already enumerated, which is the cross product, right? And this feature is of course very nice because we will see that the algorithms uh, that are coming next, they have some restrictions on the uh, type of predicates they can operate on. So they will not be useful or not be applicable to arbitrary zeta joins. And that means that if we have a query 
involving some weird predicate, which is not equality, but more complicated, then we don't have any other choice than going to the nested loop join, right? So nested loop join is the fallback uh, join processing algorithm in the database. But of course, it's not cheap, right? So here is how it's operating. I guess I will just um, very briefly mention this or click show that you see both um, input table tables. We have employee and, uh, and phone number tables. So you see for the um, certain employee, for instance, uh, Jim has the employment ID 10. So we find him here and the phone number is 110. And now does, how does the algorithm works? Well, it's nested loop. So we will start here with Jim and then we go through the entire table phone. And then once, once we did this, we will go to the next tuple, Joe, and go again through the entire table here. And when we do this, we'll always look at combinations of tuples from left and right side. And if the ID matches, we will append the concatenation of these two tuples uh, to our result. Right? So in this case, we are talking about an equijoin, or to be more precise, we're talking about even a natural join because we're looking here at attribute names which are called the same way. So the resulting schema will not have two times ID, but just one time ID and then name and number, obviously. Right? And we can see how this works. Right? So we, we compare the tuple 10 gym to 123, we see that the IDs do not match, so we will ignore this, this is not a result. And then we go on and we see here that now we're comparing these two tuples and well, yeah, it's 10 and 10, so this matches and we will include this to our result. And then the whole thing continues and continues. And you see it's expensive, it takes a long time, but it's guaranteed to visit all pairs from left and right side, so the cross product, and only for those where the predicate matches, we will include the pair to our result. And here you see the full result. If you remember, and probably everyone has seen this already, and we, we teach this very briefly only, but at least we mentioned this in the undergraduate course, that these operators are implemented after so-called iterator interface, so iterator-based implementation. So you're writing, if you um, consider, for instance, iterators in Java, so you have an object and you can open the object and then you can call the next function of the object and the next function will if there is a um, result, give you the, uh, the next result entry or the result object, right? So if you have a list in Java and you're getting an, an, oper an iterator over this list, you can call next, 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 and so on, and iterate over all these entries of the array or list. And the same uh, principle we have here in the database as well. We have an operator-based implementation usually, so you have an operator that is reading from R, we have an operator that is selecting tuples of a certain predicate and so on. We have a join operator, obviously, that we're talking about now, and uh, another operator that is reading from S and a projection operator and so on. And now the operator idea is that the topmost operator, in this case the, the projection, will call open on the child operator, which is the join. And the join will likewise call open oper operation for the selection and the scan of the relation and then finally here also this will arrive at the scan operator for for the relation r and then the topmost operator can call next and then the tree below the projection operator will produce tuples and every next call of the topmost um, operator will yeah will cause the downward operators to produce results in the same way, if the join operator wants to read more tuples from the left input, which is this subtree, 
it will call next as well. Right? So the, call, the next calls are propagating through the tree. And what you see here is the nested loop join as an operator implementation. Right? So the, if you think about Java iterator, here we have nested loop iterator. If you if you're opening the nested loop operator, what it will do, or iterator, what it will do, it will open the left input by calling the open method. And then it will, when you when it should produce a result, when the up, upmost um, operator is calling next on the, um, the nested loop iterator using this next method, it goes through this um, procedure, right? And if you're reading the details of the pseudo code, it will just do exactly what we have already illustrated before. It will read over the entire write input. And when this is done, and there's still left input available, it will again open the write input and again walk through that to find results, right? So that's like the way you would implement that. And of course, this works also for other operators. And um, I think we don't have to repeat that. Pretty clear, I think the selection is very simple and protection is also very simple. This load is a bit more complicated and later on some more fancy join or like duplicate elimination, of course, they are a bit more complicated than selection or projection. But this is like the way you would implement that.